So I'm going to read an extract tonight from a book called Beyond the Mist by Peter O'Connor, who's a psychologist. And he shows us how ancient Irish mythology can be used to understand the universal themes and conflicts that have affected humankind throughout the course of time. In chapters 4 and 6 of his book, Peter O'Connor describes the gods and goddesses of the Gaelic pantheon. And he shows that through their characteristics and activities, they metaphorically represent these uh, aspects of the human psyche. Uh, symbolic concepts within ourselves, which, which must be conquered uh, to understand. Chapter 6. The Goddesses, the Feminine Archetypes. Irish mythology has an essentially feminine quality, and female deities feature in so many stories of the land and the islands that lie off the coast. It has been suggested that a matriarchal culture preceded the patriarchal one. While this may be true, the more likely explanation is that the feminine is a personification of the fertility of the land. This personification is often in the figure of the sovereign queen, with whom the mortal aspirant for kingship must have union if he is to rule. The Celtic notion of sacral kingship would seem to find its equivalent in the medieval alchemical idea of the hero's gamos, or the chymical wedding, which led to the creation of the philosopher's stone. Whilst the gods' heroic attributes give them a certain measure of power and independence, there always seems to be another power which ensures that they are not completely masters of their own destiny. The Greek father god, Zeus, is seen as obeying some higher power, variously named as Fatum or Moira. The word Fatum is the origin of our English word fate, in turn derived from the verb fair, to speak, and is translated to mean that which has been spoken. In this sense, it is a form of div divine decree. Within the Greek mythological tradition, the fates, or Moirae, were three old women, the daughters of Nyx, the night. Clotho span the thread of life, Lachesis assigned to each person his or her destiny, and Atropos carried the shears that cut the tread at death. It is said that they arrived shortly after the birth of a child to decide upon the course of the child's life. They were also invoked at marriage to ensure that the union was a healthy one and finally when the end of life approached they had to be summoned to cut the thread indeed the whole of life was shattered by the fates and it takes little thought to perceive the parallel of the fates to the theme of life death and renewal that so characterizes irish mythology it seems plausible therefore that the other power behind the gods is the inevitability of this cycle to which all are subjected gods included. Irish goddesses are usually de depicted as triple goddesses, emphasising their link to the three fates. The triple goddess personifies a state of wholeness. She is the symbol of the eternal state and the goal itself, which is the acceptance and integration of the three processes of birth, life and death. The figure of the triple goddess of Ireland could be seen as personifying the fourth state that emerges out of her embodiment of the tree. Often we become preoccupied with renewal, or beginnings, in a pattern that Jung has determined the pure child archetype. This pattern can most readily be seen in connection with relationships where some people, more often men, can only ever begin relationships usually in a highly sexualized manner. Yet, within a short period of time the relationship ends, since the addiction is to the excitement of beginnings, not to relating and the possibility of growth. Others may become obsessed by the fear of death and lose all sight of life and beginnings as they plummet into depression. Here, the relationship pattern is one of not getting involved because of the belief that it will not last. Yet others hang on to life, refusing to concede that the only permanent thing is change itself, thereby denying themselves the possibility of renewal. Relationships caught in this pattern simply become stagnant and often moribund, since change is perceived as a threat to order and fixity. In these relationships, libido is often sacrificed 
and the altar of security. The goal of individuation as espoused by Jung may well be wholeness, but this in turn constitutes a willingness to accept the inevitability of the never-ending cycle of life, death and renewal. The task of consciousness then would be to come to grips with the realization that we are permanently in flux. We must be prepared at times to let go of our attachment to certain possessions and views in order to let Thanatos, death, do its work, allowing them to die as a necessary prelude to the renewal process. If the ego and the persona dominate our being, then we cannot yield to the inevitable, since we would be preoccupied with control. And the end result is that we get stuck in the illusion that what we see is all there is. Danu, Dana, or Anu. It is generally accepted that Anu, Danu, or Dana are one and the same deity, and that she is the mother of the gods. But just as the Dagda is seen as the father of the tribe, Danu was not literally their mother. Rather, Anu or Dana is a fertility goddess associated with the plenty and prosperity of the land. She is described as the one who nurtures well the gods. The province of Munster in the southwest of Ireland is said to owe its fertility to Anu, and two mountains in Kerry are known as the Paps of Anu. The mythical tribe of the Tuathedanan are, of course, the people of the goddess Danu. On Caelach Viara, the Hag of Biara, another much less written about female figure who is also a mother goddess, but possibly much earlier than Dana, is the Caelach Viara, the old Hag of the Biara Peninsula in West Cork. She is a complex figure and would appear to be a predecessor to the Celts themselves. She is also a corn goddess and associated with the protection of fertility. Indeed, in one story, she put to death a succession of male reapers who failed to match her prowess with the sickle. The story reflects a frequent mythological theme of a local hero and the female deity opposing each other in a reaping contest in which the female deity, symbolising fertility, inevitably triumphs. Her other manifestations include a role as shaper of the land itself. It is said that she dropped cairns on the hill of mead out of her apron, and that she was responsible for creating many of the rocks and islands around the southwest coast of Ireland. Deep ravines and valleys are the result of her having run her nails across the landscape. In another role, she is seen as symbolising the wild forces of nature, especially storms at sea. This role is strongly associated with the Cialach, or the people of the Biera Peninsula. She is also a symbol of longevity and is said to have passed through seven periods of youth and old age so that her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren are the people and tribes of Ireland. Thus she represents three aspects of the feminine, young maiden, mother and old crone. The Chialach is also the sovereign queen under the name Bui. She appears as the wife of Lu, the divine prototype of kingship. These roles all illustrate the mother goddess function and the associations with nature and fertility, which may suggest that she is a very early goddess whom perhaps the continental Celts incorporated into their pantheon to symbolise the land of Ireland itself. She is believed to be embodied today in a special stone that stands overlooking the sea near Iries in Cork, where she awaits the return of her husband, Mananan, lord of the sea. Bridget of Rigid. Another composite early figure is Bridget, who later became the Christian Saint Bridget. Sometimes she, she is seen as interchangeable with Danu, and she is also described as the daughter of the Dagda. However, she is mostly seen in her own right as a goddess adored by poets, blacksmiths and physicians. She is also associated with childbirth, fertility and the hearth and in these capacities she could readily be seen as the Irish equivalent of some composite Hestia Artemis figure from Greek mythology, the latter being associated with childbirth and the former with the hearth. Her festival on the 1st of August is called Imbolg, which is one of the four great Irish seasonal festivals. Imbolg is a pagan spring festival and is associated with the lactation of ewes, linking Bridget to fertility and the abundance of animals. 
she was appropriated by Christianity and became St. Bridget, but has nevertheless preserved much of her original character, since St. Bridget is associated with childbirth, and folklore has it that she was the midwife of the Virgin Mary. In her Christian capacity she is also considered to bring abundance to the country hearth that she visits, and as an Irish saint she takes second place only to St. Patrick. She and the Chaylach indicate the persistent presence of these fertility goddesses right up to the present time. The land of Ireland is still the goddesses, no matter what name she goes by. Macha Macha is one of a group of Irish goddesses who are concerned with war, fertility and prosperity of land. She is sometimes perceived as one goddess and sometimes as three, but either way she represents the sovereignty and fertility of Ireland and covers an enormous period of time, from the mythological prehistory period through to the beginning of the Christian era. She gave her name to Remain Macha, the seat of the ancient kings of Ulster. Macha is connected to the festival of Lunasa, the harvest festival on the 1st of August. An interesting aspect of these later goddesses is the explicit appearance of warlike capacities. In the earlier figures, warlike or destructive aspects are embedded in the goddesses' associations with nature, such as the Kylox personification as a goddess of the wildness of nature. In the later goddesses, it is clearly developed role, perhaps symbolizing the heroic male's increasing consciousness of the power of nature to control his fate. The first of the three Machas, the wife of Nemed takes us back to the Book of Invasions and the arrival of the Nemedians, the third group of invaders to settle in Ireland following Caesar and Partholone. She prophesies the destruction that would be wrought when Connacht fought Ulster over the great brown bull of Cooley, and the burning of this foresight caused her to die of a broken heart. The account of this battle is known simply as the Tom. It constitutes the greatest heroic tale of Ireland, with the central role being played by the hero, Cúchulán. Macha died on one of the twelve plains cleared by her husband, Nemed, and the plain is named after her. This figure of Macha is clearly an agrarian deity, associated with the clearing and cultivation of the land, and hence predominantly a fertility goddess. The second Macha, Macha the Red, was the daughter of one of the three ancient kings of Ireland who ruled alternately, each for seven years. Mythic history places them around the 6th to 4th century BC. When Macha's father died, she was elected to rule, but the other two kings refused to give her the throne because she was a woman. In the war that followed, the victorious Macha banished one of her rivals to Connacht, marrying the other and making him chief of, chief of her army. The five sons of the banished king then sought to contest the throne, but she visited them in disguise as a leper. She enticed them one by one to lie with her, and in turn bound each of them to slavery. Macha the Red is clearly the warrior goddess dominating. The third of the Machas, the wife of Crunchu, conforms to the familiar mythological fairy tale theme of the supernatural bride who lives happily with a mortal husband until he violates a taboo with the result that she dies. One day, a beautiful woman walked into the house of a peasant widow named Crunchu. Without speaking a word, she set about doing the housework, and at night she made the ritualistic right-handed journey around the room, anti-clockwise being an omen of bad fortune and entered Crunchu's bed. She became pregnant by him, and through this union he prospered greatly. At this point in the story, Macha embodies the sovereign queen, as union with the archetypal feminine is a source of fertility. Crunchu was required to attend an assembly of all Ulster men at Tara, and before he set off, Macha warned him not to mention her name nor speak of her at the assembly. At the assembly, much was made of the ability of the king's horses, with the poets singing their praises and exalting their swiftness. Crunchu forgot Macca's warning, and declared that his wife could run faster than any of the king's horses. The king took up the challenge and ordered Crunchu to bring his wife to race against his horses. In vain, Macca protested and asked for a delay, as she was close to giving birth 
but the king insisted that she race or he would put Crunchy to death. Reluctantly she raced and beat the king's horses, but as she finished she cried out in pain and gave birth to two twins. The exertion proved fatal for Maka, and she died in giving birth. But with her last breath she cursed the men of Ulster. For nine times, nine generations, at times of great peril, the men of Ulster would suffer the sickness of childbirth and therefore would be too tired and weak to fight in battle. Some scholars have interpreted this curse, which is called the Novena of the Ulster Men, as a form of the practice amongst primitive peoples called Kuvade, whereby the husband of a woman in childbirth has opposed upon him the same seclusion and precautions as upon the mother. The aim of this appears to be that the husband will take on the pain of the woman, thereby assisting in the birth process. process. A second interpretation of this curse is that it serves to underline the power of other world women and the superiority of their power to that of the male warrior. A third explanation is that the curse, being activated at a time of war, is a symbolic mime in honour of the mother goddess. In this sense it is an act of propitiation, aimed at giving the warriors protection in the forthcoming battle. In this third maca we, see, we can see the dominance of the functions of childbirth, nurturance and fertility. Thus, the three makas present maternal reproductive power, nurturance and fertility, and warlike or sexual attributes. Of the three, one can be seen to fulfil Dumizel's sorcerer function with her prophecy of a future period of destruction. Maka the Red fulfills the function of force with her warrior-like behaviour, and the third Maka represents fertility. The use of threes is a dominant feature of Irish mythology and may well have symbolised some sense of totality itself. For example, in the realm of time it might represent past, present and future, and in relation to space, the qualities of a head, behind and here. It could also be seen as representing the dimensions of earth, sky and sea, and Christianity uses triplication in the notion of the Holy Trinity. In Egyptian mythology it is re represented in the figures of Osiris, Isis and Horus. Within the alchemical tradition it exists in the three stages of Negrido, Albedo and Rubedo. Philosophy has its own version of it in Hegel's Thesis, Antithesis and Synthesis. Consistent throughout these various examples is the assumption that 3 equals 1 and that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Irish mythology then is not unique in its incorporation of trees, but the extent to which they are used is striking. The Marigna There is one group of three female deities that can lay special claim to the title of Goddess of War, and that is the group known as the Marigna. The persons of this trio are not always the same, but usually comprise the Bav, the Crow, the Morrigan, the Queen of Phantoms, and either the Main, which is Panic, or Macha. These war goddesses do not normally engage in armed combat, as their weapons belong to the magical world of sorcery and inspire dread and terror. The Main, for example, creates panic amongst fighting men, and in a battle against Cúchulainn, a hundred warriors fell dead when they heard her cry. Even when the goddess of war is enticed to take part in battle, she will do so by magic, often appearing in animal form. So the Morrigan attacks Cúchulainn in the shape of an eel, which winds itself around his legs. At other times she appears as a wolf and drives a frightened herd of cattle at him. Hu Collins has spurned her overtures of love and ungraciously declared that he had no need of a woman's help. Bab appears as a crow, and in this form she lands on Hu Collins' shoulder as a portent of his imminent death, signalling that it is safe to approach and behead him. Bab is essentially a prophetess of death and her finds her direct equivalent in Atropos, the faith who cuts the thread of life. Bav also finds her contemporary expression in the Banshee, the Irish fairy whose crying is a portent of death. She also appears in the role 
of washer at the ford, washing the arms and clothes of a warrior who is to die shortly. The morrigan can play a similar role as the harbinger of death. Both the morrigan and Bav also have powerful sexual roles, and Bav has been described as a femme fatale who befriends the hero and then leads him to his death. When the Dagda mates with the Morrigan, she symbolizes the sovereign queen, ensuring the fertility of the land. These three figures that constitute the Morigna are interchangeable, but as a single or triple figure, they are personifications of nature in both her life-giving and life-destroying capacities. Man, in the form of a hero, sets out to conquer nature in order to have it serve him. This, of course, finds its psychological parallel in the heroic role that the ego must play in facilitating a measure of consciousness of the life-giving or eros qualities and the life-destroying or thanatos qualities of the unconscious mind. But just as the marigna is not a figure that can be easily overcome, neither can the unconscious be conquered in any complete sense. This realm, like the marigna, is the source of both being and non-being. We may, we may well need our own version of a sacral marriage with the sovereign queen if our lives are to remain fertile. Dreams, and the paying of attention to them, are of course a simple means of enacting this ritual. Ignoring or rejecting the marigna, as Cúhollan does, can only bring about our death. Psychologically speaking, the death of consciousness. The crow of depression sitting on our shoulders or the eel of anxiety winding around us can be signs of this death which we must struggle to understand if we are not to succumb to the meaninglessness, a specific form of death in itself. Queen Maeve Queen Maeve of Connacht is described as being sexually promiscuous. It is said of her that never was she without one man in the shadow of another. She mated with at least nine mortal kings and refused to allow any king to rule in Tara who had not first mated with her. This marks her out as a mythological sovereign queen with her promiscuity symbolizing the fertility of the land itself. The most important story concerning Queen Maeve is the cattle raid of Cooley, which belongs to the Ulster cycle. Maeve is jealous of her husband, King Aelil who possesses a magnificent white bull. Maeve hears of a fabulous brown bull and sends her army to invade Ulster to acquire it. During the battle that follows, she appears as a warrior inciting her army to fight, and several times she pits her wits against the Ulster hero Cúchulainn. So she is associated with war, death and fertility. Some may ask why there is no Irish equivalent of Venus or Aphrodite, McCanna suggests that the mythological personification of sexual love is bound up in the role of the Irish goddess as sovereign queen and a personification of the fertility of the land. As Joe Stett points out, points out, to wonder that we do not find a goddess presenting this character to the exclusion of all others is to judge Celtic mythology by foreign standards and so to condemn oneself to a misconstruction of its intimate system. Etain or Aideen. Although Etain is not usually presented as a deity, she can nevertheless be considered to be a goddess since she is thrice born and her lives cover an enormous expanse of time. In addition, she plays a role as a sovereign queen. In relating the famous story of the wearing of Etain, I have relied on three major sources. One is a very comprehensive version of the stories by Geoffrey Gantz. The second is from the Irish scholar Miles Dillon, and the third, a recent imaginative version by Marie Heaney. The story commences with the birth of Angus, who was conceived from the union between the Dagda and Bowen, and was then fostered out to Midir. Midir, who was also known as Midir the Proud because he wore such magnificent clothes, lived with his wife, Fulmnach, who truly, in truly splendid surroundings, in the Shi at Brie Fionnach was both knowledgeable and clever, and was very well versed in magic and sorcery since she had been reared by the druid Bressel. Medir was very attached to Angus, and was missing him since Angus had moved into his own she at Brina Boyne. Medir decided to visit him, 
and when he arrived he found Inga sitting Inga sitting on a mound watching a group of boys playing. Suddenly a fight broke out between the boys, and Medea decided to intervene to break it up. It was not easy to part them, and as he struggled to do so, a sprig of holly was hurled at him, putting out one of his eyes. He gathered up his eye from the ground and returned to Angus, complaining that now that he was blemished he would not be able to see and rule over the land he had come from. Medea blamed Angus, cursing that he had ever come to see him. But Angus told him that they would go and find the physician Dean Kecht. The latter was summoned, and it was not long before he had returned Medea's eye to his socket, and the healing process had begun. However, Medea demanded compensation for the injury, and Angus, ever ready to please his foster father, agreed to meet his request. As part of his compensation, Medea wanted the fairest maiden in Ireland. Others say that the following that following the healing of his eye, Medea wanted to leave Bruno Boyne, but Angus pleaded with him to stay. Medea agreed on the condition that Angus give him a chariot worth seven kumals, female slaves, and clothing appropriate to my rank and the fairest woman in Eru. Angus agreed to the conditions and set off to acquire the fairest woman in Ireland, whom he knew to be Etain, the daughter of King Ailil of Ulster. When Angus arrived at King Ailil's palace, he announced that he had come to seek his daughter. The king agreed, provided some conditions were first met. The first of these was that twelve plains be cleared so that the cattle could graze on them. Angus felt overwhelmed by the size of the task and sought the help of his natural father, the Dagda, who met his son's request and in one night cleared the twelve plains. But King Ailil now wanted twelve rivers to be diverted from the land to the sea. Again Angus felt overwhelmed by the request and sought the help of his father who diverted the rivers overnight. Ailil now asked for Etain's weight in gold, since he claimed the other compensations had been for the benefit of the people, not for him personally. Thus he was given Etain's weight in gold, and Angus left with Etain for Bruna Boyne. Etain stayed with Medea for a whole year at Bruna Boyne, but then he decided to return to his own she. When he arrived back at Brilly, he was welcomed by his wife Fulmnoch, who also made Etain feel very welcome. But appearances were deceptive, and Fulmnoch was plotting her rival's demise. On the pretext of showing Etain to her room, Fulmnoch struck her with a wand that instantly turned her into a pool of water. She then fled to her foster father Bressel's house, fearing Medea's anger. A fire near the pool of water heated it up, and out of the water emerged a worm which before very long turned into a beautiful crimson fly with jeweled eyes and enameled wings. When it moved its wings it created wonderful music, and whenever it went, wherever it went it left a beautiful fragrance in the air. Though she now had the shape of a fly, Etain retained the feelings of a woman, and she went off in search of Medea. She found him asleep in a room as she flew around creating the beautiful music and fragrance. Medea awoke and realised immediately that it was Etain. From then on she accompanied Medea everywhere, lulling him to sleep with her music and also warning him of any approaching enemies. Medea knew that so long as Etain was with him, he could never love another woman. When Fulmlock heard of this enduring love, she was overcome by a jealous rage and once again began to plot Etain's demise. She decided to return to Brie but when she arrived, Medea attacked her angrily for what she had done to Etain. Unmoved by Medea's anger, she began to chant a spell that suspended his love for Etain and rendered all his magic powerless. She then called up a great wind that blew all through Brie taking Etain helplessly before it and blowing her out to sea. For seven years, Etain was continually buffeted by the wind and could find no resting place other than odd rocks in the ocean and on the waves. At last, she was miraculously blown over by a boy. Utterly exhausted and barely able to lift her wings, she fell on to Angus's cloak and he immediately recognised her. He welcomed her into his house, tended to her needs, and then set about building her a glass room to live in. Etain felt safe and secure in this space, 
and her spirit was uplifted by the strange fragrant herbs that Angus had placed in the bower. A great love grew between Angus and Ethain, who brought joy and happiness into Angus's life just as she had for Medeir. However, yet again, Fruimnach heard of this love and happiness and again plotted to destroy Etain. She knew that she would not be able to get direct access to Etain at Brunaboyn, so she was forced to conjure up a more devious scheme. Medir and Angus had naturally fallen out over Etain, so Fruimnach offered to arrange a reconciliation meeting on a hill outside Brunaboyn. The men waited for Fulmnock to join them there, but such a long time passed that they became uneasy and decided to return to the palace. Angus went to the glass bearer, and to his horror discovered that Etain was gone. Immediately he knew that the jealous Fulmnock had been at work. Some say that he was so angry that when he found Fulmnock hiding in the palace he cut off her head. When Angus had initially left to meet with Medir, Fulmnach had circled around Bruna Boyne from the opposite direction, found Etain in her glass room and once again conjured up a powerful wind that sent her back out to sea. For another seven years she was constantly blown over the land and seas of Ireland and could find no resting place. At last she was blown inland towards the great hall of a castle and there she alighted on a beam high above the floor where a festival was in progress. This was the castle of Atar, a great Ulster champion, and much drinking and feasting was going on. Finally, Etain, exhausted from her long ordeal, could cling no longer to the beam and fell straight into the golden globulet of Etar's wife just as she was raising it to her mouth. She swallowed the wine and Etain in one mouthful. Etar's wife was unaware of what happened, but in nine months later, she gave birth to a beautiful girl whom they called Etain. Thus ends the first story, or rather, the first part of the story. The second story commences when Etain is about 20 years of age. However, as is the way with myths, a thousand years had elapsed and Yochad Erum was now king of Ireland. In the first year of his reign he called together an assembly of all the chieftains and their people to be held at Tara at Sawan. However, word came back that the chieftains would not attend because the king did not have a wife and no man could attend this festival without his wife. Yukud immediately dispatched his messengers to travel throughout the land to find the fairest woman to become his queen. He insisted that in addition to the woman also be a nobleman's daughter and a virgin, and it was Etain, daughter of Itar, whom the messengers ascertained as being ideal in all respects. The king himself set out to meet her and acquire her hand in marriage. As he and his retinue approached Atar's house, they came across a beautiful woman washing herself beside a well. Yochid was mesmerised by the woman and instantly fell in love with her. When he asked her name, she replied, I am Etain, daughter of Itar, a chieftain and nobleman of Ulster. Yochid was so overjoyed to discover that this beautiful woman, woman was to be his bride and they married immediately and returned to Tara. It was said that all are lovely till compared with Etain, all are fair till compared with Etain, and it was this beauty that caused Yucca's brother Aelil to fall in love with her. He would gaze upon her endlessly, and his will not to do so was powerless against his desire for her. But he could not reveal these wishes to anyone, since it was a transgression to lust after his brother's wife. As the obsession grew stronger and stronger, he became weaker and started to waste away. No one knew what mysterious illness had overtaken the king's brother. A whole year passed with Aelil, continuing to waste away until Yuchid insisted that his own physician, Hwakna, see his brother. The physician put his hand on Aelil's chest, and at that instant Aelil let out a huge sigh. Hwakna turned to Aelil and said, You have one of two pangs that no doctor can cure. The pang of love and the pang of jealousy. Aelil knew this to be true, but he could not reveal his secret and continued to deteriorate and move towards death. King Yukid had to travel throughout his kingdom, but before he left he gave Etain instructions for the care and burial of his dying brother. Etain undertook all these tasks willingly, but as she tended Aelil, she noticed that contrary to all expectations, he started to get better. 
Finally, out of frustration and desperation, Adil confessed to Etain that he was in love with her, and the only thing that could cure him was if they would become lovers. Etain could not bear the thought of Adil dying because of his unmet love for her, yet nor could she bear the thought of betraying her husband in his own house. After an agonising period of confusing, she arranged to meet Adil on a hill at daybreak. Elil lay awake all night, excited by the thoughts of a possible union with Etain. But as the appointed hour, he fell into a deep sleep and did not awake until the third hour of the next day. Etain, in the meantime, went to the hill as arranged, and the man she saw waiting for her looked exactly like Elil. But as she got closer, she realised it was not him, and the figure she saw did not speak but merely moved on and went away. When Aelil finally woke up, he was devastated to realise he had missed a rendezvous with Etain, and she, out of concern for him, agreed to meet under the same arrangements the next day. But again a strange sleep overtook Aelil at the precise time of the meeting, which Etain and again the stranger appeared to her in his place. For the third time, a meeting was arranged between Etain and Aelil, and the same events occurred. However, this time Etain asked the stranger who he was. He replied that he had come to meet her, but Etain protested that she had come to meet Aelil, brother of King Yuchud, not the person who stood before her. The stranger replied, It would be more fitting for you to come to me, for when you were Etain's daughter of King Aelil, I was your husband. Etain was startled by this statement, and anxiously asked the stranger who he was. Since she had no memory of the past that the stranger spoke of, he replied, I am Medir of Brili, and it was the evil sorcery of Fiumlach that parted us, and it was I who put the love into the heart of Yuchud's brother Aelil, so that we might meet. He turned to Etain and pleaded for her to come to Brili with him, where she belonged. Etain was utterly bewildered by all of this, but somewhere within her there was a haunting sense of familiarity with this figure, who called himself Medir. After a while she hesitatingly agreed that she would go with him, so long as her husband agreed. She felt she was on safe ground here since she did not believe that Yukud would agree to such a thing. Madeira smiled and quickly agreed to the terms that Etain had set out and with that he magically disappeared. Shortly after, the king returned from his royal circuit and was delighted to find his brother not only alive but well. He thanked Etain for her exemplary care of him. But Etain kept her silence on both the cause and the cure. Medir, who had originally created the desire in Aelil, and who had protected Etain's honour by putting him to sleep at the critical time, had released Aelil from his illness by quelling his desire. Thus ends the second story. The third story commences when King Yukud, standing on the terrace of his palace, admiring the beauty of the surrounding landscape. On the distant horizon he observed a figure who, as he got closer, appeared to be a warrior who wore a deep purple cloak, had golden shoulder-length hair, and carried a shield in one hand and a spear in the other. Yuckett was perplexed, for he knew that the gates of the fort had not yet been opened, and thus the warrior could not belong to the company that had arrived the previous night. By now the stranger was facing Yuckett, who asked him, Who are you? I don't recognise you. The stranger replied, not a famous one. Medeir of Brili is my name. Then what has brought you here? asked Yuckard. To which Medeir replied that he had come to play chess with the king. Yuckard was taken aback by all this and tried to stall Medeir by saying his chess set was in the queen's quarters and he could not disturb her. To the king's astonishment, Medeir promptly produced the chess set and the game was all ready to commence when Yuckard said he would not play unless there was a stake. Medir obligingly invited Yuckett to name his stake, and the king nominated fifty of the finest horses. Medir lost, and next morning the king looked out on the grass around the planis, pl palace and observed fifty magnificent horses grazing contently. Yuckett was delighted with his prize and enthusiastically challenged Medir to another game. The stake this time involved clearing the land and rendering it fertile. Medir agreed on condition that if he lost, Yuckert had to guarantee that he would prevent anyone in his kingdom from witnessing the clearing of the land. 
where they played the second game and did lose, thus being required to clear the land. Yukut could not resist the temptation to know what was happening and sent out, sent one of his stewards to secretly observe the work. Medea was furious and demanded that Yukut pay retribu retribution for the betrayal. Medea said they must play another game and that whoever won that game would name his prize. Yukut had no choice but to accept Medea's terms since he had violated the trust. This time Medea won. Yukut was terrified that Medea would name some enormous stake and perhaps take back what he had already won and more besides. To his astonishment, Medea stated that he wanted to take the Queen Athene in his arms and kiss her. Completely thrown by this request, Yukut hesitatingly agreed but asked that Medea come back in a month to claim his stake. Sensing some sort of danger in the mysterious stranger's request, Yukut spent the entire month assembling the warriors of Ireland to protect his palace and prevent Medea from entering. However, at the due moment, Medea suddenly appeared in their mists while the king was banqueting. Medea declared, what is promised is now due. He then embraced Etain, and as he did so, they rose up into the air and were transformed into two beautiful swans who flew out of the palace through an opening in the roof. From there they flew to Bree Lee, where Etain was rejoined her kinfolk, the two ahead of Danon. Yukut, full of grief and anger at the loss of Etain, was also furious that Medea had tricked him and made up his mind to retrieve his wife. He traversed all of Ireland, digging up every fairy mount he could find, for he knew, now knew that she had been taken by one of the folk of the other world. To his dismay, however, every time he dug up a mound, by the next morning, morning all of the dirt had been replaced exactly as it had originally been. Yukut was undeterred, and some say that he continued to dig up fairy mounds for nine years. Finally, in desperation, he sought the advice of a druid who revealed that Medea and Etain were at Bree Lee. Just as Yukut was making his assault on Bree Lee, Medea called a truce and offered to return Etain to him the next day. But Medea, using his magical gifts, tricked Yukut, and at the appointed third hour of the following day, fifty women all looking exactly like Etain appeared. Imperiously, Medea declared that Yukut could have Etain back if he could identify the true Etain. Yukut remembered how beautifully Etain had borrowed wine, so he requested that each of the women perform the task. Each woman in turn poured until there were only two left, and as the second last woman took the jug and started to pour, Yukut spontaneously declared that she was Etain, claimed her, and returned with her to Tara. Much later, when Etain was pregnant, Yukut discovered again, through the ages of Medea, that the woman he had chosen was not Etain, but his own daughter, since his wife was pregnant with her when she flew away with Medea. Reeling in horror from this incestuous union, he declared to the gods, Never will I look upon the daughter of my daughter. And he arranged that when the child was born, two members of his household would take the child and throw it into a pit of wild beasts. The two servants could not bring themselves to throw the tiny infant into the pit, but left her in an isolated herdsman's hut with a bitch and her pups. When the herdsman and his wife returned, they were astonished to find the infant, but accepted her unhesitatingly and reared her as if she was their own child. She, in accordance with her divine heritage, prospered and displayed exceptional beauty and skill. In due course she was discovered by a prince, of whom it had been prophesied that he would marry a woman of unknown origin, and that she would bear him a child. This duly happened, and that child became the legendary Conair Moore, the central character in a later Ulster story entitled The Destruction of the Dergers Hostel. The Wooing of Etain is a mysterious and haunting tale that captures the essence of the Irish mythological world. It has a sense of timelessness as it moves between two worlds, the natural and the supernatural, the mortal and the divine. Etain is undoubtedly a symbol of life, death and renewal. Some scholars, notably McCulloch and Gantz, have suggested that the ancient Irish held ideas of reincarnation, which are symbolised in the mythic theme of rebirth. Certainly the archaeological evidence points to the ancient Celts burying their dead with the clear intention of providing for a journey 
indicating a firm belief in the other world and perhaps rebirth. Many of the Irish divinities do not appear to die per se, but live for generation to generation, as seen in the figure of Etain. The fact that Etain was transformed into a beautiful crimson fly is also of some significance in the mythological context. For example, the ancient Greeks believed that the soul could travel from one life to another in insect form. The idea of incarnation would presumably have been anathema to the Christian scribes and it is possible that many more direct references to these beliefs have been edited out. Hence we are left with stories that merely point towards these beliefs rather than stating them. However, belief in rebirth is entirely consistent with the pattern of life, death and renewal that so pervades Irish mythology. In this context, we can also see Etain as a seasonal goddess symbolising the death and rebirth of the crops, which links her to De Demeter and Persephone of Greek mythology. Etain is also, of course, a sovereign queen figure. When King Yucut summons his people to Tara and they refuse to come because he is without a wife, he is reminded that in order to be a rightful king of the gland, he has first to be accepted as the legitimate spouse of the goddess who personifies the land itself. Without this union, the land could not prosper and would remain infertile. Finally, within the Jungian mythological framework, Etain is an archetypal feminine, or more precisely, the archetypal anima. Her archetypal status is confirmed by the company she keeps, the gods, Medir and Engus. The gods of mythology are the archetypes of Jung and their territory, so to speak, is what Jung has termed the collective unconscious. The collective psyche is not something we acquire as a result of our personal history, but rather as a consequence of the history of the species. In this sense, it is permanent and continuous and like the divine figures cannot die, but merely passes from one generation to the next. Yukud, as a mortal figure, has to compete with a supernatural rival for a relationship with the feminine in the figure of Etain. This represents the task of building a personal relationship with the anima or feminine aspects of our being, the task of developing a conscious awareness of our feelings and an enhanced capacity both to connect and to communicate them. If the feminine remains at the archetypal level, then feelings remain impersonal stereotyped and invariably projected out rather than seen as part of ourselves. So a man, for example, will project a fantasy image of the ideal woman onto a real woman and she will have the unnerving feeling that the intense relationship she is experiencing is really not much to do with her but with some fantasy about her. The same pattern is manifested by women when they project the archetypal animus onto mortal men. The relationship will have a peculiar and personal quality about it being on the receiving end of such projections is often described by the phrase he or she is full on. Relationships starting out with this intensity usually finish as quickly as they started and very often have a distinctly obsessional and possessive quality. To be in the grip of archetypal images and energy is to be impersonal and not really present to the self or others. This can take the form of idealization where there is absolutely no perception of negatives or intense denigration and rage, where there exists no positives. From this latter position, murder and mayhem are easy since the constraint of the awareness of the other as such does not exist. This we normally call madness. The figure of Yukud is the hero of this story and within contemporary psychology, mythology, he is associated with the ego. The role of the ego, like that of the hero in the ancient stories, is to journey the unknown lands, the unconscious, and there to confront unknown and frightening figures that symbolise aspects of our own being. These are figures for which Jung would use such terms as the shadow, or anima and animus. If the hero, or heroine, successfully completes the journey, then the ego is altered by the experience. This is usually manifested in the maturing of the personality, which in turn is reflected in, in an increase in tolerance of ambiguity. However, the heroic figure is often reluctant to undertake the journey, preferring instead to adhere to fixed views about him or herself and the world. In Jungian psychology, the figure of the king, 
usually represents the ruling principle of the psyche or those values and attitudes with which the ego is identified and which govern everyday behaviour. Thus we could see King Yuki's relationship with the Itain as the interaction of the ego with the archetypal feminine, a necessary first step in ensuring the fertility of one's own growth and maturation as an individual. Medir is a complex figure, but perhaps could be seen as the negative animus. The negative animus is considered to represent archetypal negative masculine qualities such as fixed opinions and is essentially antagonistic to feminine values such as relationships, receptiveness, ambiguity and feelings. The desire of the negative animus is to disconnect and we have already seen disconnection is at times a vital factor in enabling the process of change to occur and is an essential part of the cycle of eternal change. However, if the negative animus is a dominating force within a woman's psyche, it can result in a sad history of unfulfilling relationships with men and finds its parallel in Medir's actions with regards to Etain. Medir keeps Etain to himself and prevents her having a relationship with Yukut. This is another way of saying that the archetypal negative animus resists any emergence of the feminine attribute of feeling. The conscious development of this more eros-based quality would create a sense of connection and this is the very phenomenon that the negative animus works against. Like his Greek equivalent Hades, Medea abducts the feminine into the other world below the surface of consciousness. From the outset we see his disdain for, of the feminine as he simply demands the most beautiful woman in Ireland and then returns with her to his wife. Whilst Furumnok may well be a negative anima figure her rage is understandable. Other people's positions or needs seem irrelevant to Medir, the proud. In some women, the negative animus can lead to a certain immaturity, with anyone holding a different view seen as unequivocally wrong. The extreme wings of the women's movement, with their rigid adherence to ideological purity, reflect the presence of the negative animus. In men, this presence is seen in a rigid patriarchal position that does not allow feminine attributes any legitimacy. Medir's hope is that Etain will simply stay in the other world of Bree Lee with him forever and not have a life in the everyday world. Medir the Proud may also symbolize a narcissistic structure within the personality that yearns for possession, not relationship, for power over others rather than a relationship with others. This is a typical masculine pattern and men as part of their maturation have to work against a narcissistic position that regards those who are different as inferior. This applies particularly to their perception of women and feminine values. Yukut's behaviour throughout the story depicts the psychological task of forming a personal relationship with the feminine attributes within himself and not leaving them entirely in the original archetypal form. His first contact with Etain is essentially archetypal insofar as he falls in love and projects onto her his fantasy of the ideal woman. He instantly knows that she is the one. The figure of Elil, Yukut's brother, is interesting. In a stereotypical male way, he perceives that the solution to his despair and depression lies in being able to have sex with Etain. Within Jung's theoretical framework, the brother figure is sometimes seen as the shadow, a figure that symbolizes attributes that are unacceptable to the conscious view we hold of ourselves or other people. Elil symbolizes Yukut's shadow obsessive desire for Etain and further depicts the absence of an actual personal relationship with the feminine. Etain, seen through the eyes of the shadow, no matter how benevolent and caring Yukut may appear, is simply an object of sexual desire, not a person. Sex, for many men, is often a substitute for intimacy, not an expression of it, particularly when there is a poorly developed relationship with his feelings. When the ego figure of Yukut is absent, busy with the demands of his job, as many modern men find themselves, the shadow really comes to the fore. It is aided and abetted by the archetypal figure of Medir who uses Elil to seduce Etain. Thus, in a psychological sense, the archetypal masculine power aids the perception of women 
as sexual objects to be conquered, not people to be connected with in a meaningful relationship. Jokud fails to develop a personal relationship with Etain, and thus the feeling side of his personality is regressed and is symbolized in the shadow of his brother. If a man's conscious view of himself centers around power, as Jokud can be seen to do, then the inevitable shadow that this casts is a dark, often obsessive and impersonal sexuality that denigrates women. The outcome for Yukut is a complete loss of contact with the feminine, not only at the personal but also at the archetypal level. The feminine finally regresses to the other world in the arms of the archetypal negative masculine and disappears from consciousness. Whilst this spurs Yukut into action, what he is driven by is the loss of an idealized fantasy, and when he discovers that he has chosen his own daughter, he rejects her vehemently, sending his child or grandchild to her death. This outcome in the story requires further thought. Jung's position on incestuous figures is informative and valuable. Incest symbolizes union with one's own being. It means individuation of or becoming self. Incest is simply the union of like with like and is the next stage in the development of the primitive idea of self-fertilization. He is of course referring to the symbol of incest in dreams and not the acting out of this image. So Yukut rejects the possibility of a union with his own personal feeling life, symbolizing the figure of his incestuously begotten daughter. Instead he continues to yearn for the idealized other woman. After all his pursuing of Etain throughout the other world and all the digging up of the unconscious, Yukut remains unchanged. He still rejects the development of personal feeling that he has banished and condemned to death. This reminds me of a certain individual who relentlessly pursued therapy in a variety of forms and settings, but after all the digging up they remain as uninsightful as when they started. The failure to accept aspects of ourselves, whether masculine or feminine, is a pervasive theme in human beings. In relationships this can be experienced as a constant pressure that one partner exerts on the other, to be who they want them to be. The desire to change one's partner is very often a refusal to accept them and a violation of their individuality. It is also, not infrequently, a means by which people avoid looking at themselves and asking what aspects of their own being they might need to change. The final part of this story may represent an alternative strategy to one of rejection that Yucca chose. The herdsman and his wife are a pair and as such symbolize the integration of the masculine and feminine at the human, not the archetypal level. The presence of royal figures in myths and dreams symbolizes the archetypal or, or impersonal level. It is this integration of opposites that enables the acceptance and maturation of the feminine in the figure of Etain's daughter. The couple also represent opposite qualities to the king. For Yukid, power and status dominate, whereas the herdsman and his wife are characterized by acceptance and humility. From this symbolic position within the psyche, the rejected feminine can be nurtured and renewal found. With the birth of a new king in the figure of Conair Moore, we can see the transformation of the ego or ruling principle that occurs as the result of the development of feminine attributes. Humility and acceptance provide the essential conditions for change since they facilitate the emergence of unconscious images and thoughts without the interference of a defensive and judging ego. When the sense of who we are is derived from an over-identification with the ego or the persona, the imagery projected a world, we are often very dismissive of thoughts and images emerging from the unconscious. Such phrases as, that's stupid or that's illogical, often point to the presence of the old king ruling the psyche and refusing to disconnect or die. The Irish goddesses tend to conform to what Jungian mythology has termed the Great Mother or Earth Mother archetype because they are so closely connected to nature and natural events. Mythologies offer many variations of this figure, for example, Demeter, Sibyl and Gaia, beloved of the New Age movement. Other symbols of this archetype are a ploughed field, a garden, a forest or the sea, or animal symbols such as the crow, the sow and the mare. The Great Mother is a symbol of both the creative forces and the destructive ones. Like all archetypes, she has both a positive and a negative side. 
Alongside the goddess's nurturing qualities is the feminine wisdom that transcends logic and asserts the inevitability of the eternal cycle of birth, life and death. The Machas, the Danu, are unequivocal, unequivocal examples of this. The Kyalak Vyara is a fine example of the archetypal hag, the holder of wisdom and knowledge of spiritual matters. When women are able to establish a conscious awareness of the relationship to these archetypal figures within themselves, they are able to stand back in any situation and know the inevitability of change. This is not passivity or compliance, but rather an action of acceptance taken in the light of knowledge. It is a yielding and not a giving in. To many men, such acceptance is misconstrued as weakness. However, men of course are so poorly connected to this feminine archetype and so preoccupied with taking action that they cannot discriminate between acceptance and giving in. However, if a woman is disconnected in this way, which is often true of very intellectual women, they, they are often prone to inertia and despair when faced with some life situation that just demands the acceptance of change. This could be the birth of a child, marital separation, or the death of a loved one. Once caught in the grip of such inertia, it is very difficult to have any sense of the dynamic process of change and the emergence of fertility that comes from the acceptance and the waiting. This requires the presence in a woman's conscious life of the Kyalak Vara, or the wisdom of the crown. In our masculine, dominated, action-oriented, rational world, this figure has experienced enormous denigration and derision. Rationality wants to triumph over life, not participate in and acknowledge the inevitability of the cycle of change. Jung captures the full complexity of this archetypal figure of the Great Mother when he describes her as the loving and the terrible mother. Hindu goddess Kali is a good example of this, and just as Mother Nature has a destructive side, earthquakes, bushfires, droughts and floods, so also does the Great Mother. The negative side of the archetype includes such attributes as the desire to dissolve all boundaries, and the view that everything is connected to everything else, and that discrimination and separateness are of no value. In this way, the negative face of the Great Mother works against the emergence of consciousness and the development of boundaries. Yet this return to chaos and the obliteration of boundaries is, of course, often the beginning of a period of creativity. But such a return, as we will see in the stories of the heroic quest, requires discrimination of conscious awareness and not a submissive, compliant giving in. For some women, it is easier to identify and indeed in some situations to over-identify with the positive nurturing qualities of this figure, to such an extent that the archetype dominates their psyche. The end result is that they become nothing more than a mother with no sense of their own individual identity. Change in this fixed role can therefore bring about major identity crisis. The children of such women can experience their mothers as extremely possessive, sometimes resulting in the child escaping into sickness, madness, or even death. The mother whose entire identity revolves around being a mother needs to possess the child as a means of keeping her own identity intact. As the child emerges into young adulthood, he is imprisoned in the mother's psyche and the engulfing face of the great mother comes into operation, preventing the forward movement of growth and development. Other women react so strongly against the nurturing aspects of this archetype that they appear to place a curse upon themselves that they will never be like their own mother. Over-identification with the destructive aspects of the archetype, meanwhile, may mean that nurturance is perceived as a weakness, and that such women are not only unable to nurture others, but also unable to nurture themselves. The masochistic martyr is one manifestation of this pattern, as also is its seeming opposite the driven corporate woman, who is unable to stop and take stock of the direction of her life. The power and wisdom of the triple goddess lies in the incorporation of all three attributes of fertility, nurturance and aggression. Perhaps it is because the goddesses are so close to nature that these three qualities have not been split or intellectualized into separate and discrete entities. Again and again the myths reveal the existence of this wisdom and the desirability of holding and containing opposites. 
And there you have it guys, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. That concludes the chapters on the gods, the male archetypes, and the goddesses, the female archetypes in Peter O'Connor.